right. All right. Good to go. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is the time and place set for the Zoning Board of Adjustment for the City of Pittsburgh hearings on July 9th, 2020. Um, we're going to start this morning with Zone Case 89 of 2020 for 1500 Latorte Street. Um, and could the people who are intending to testify in this matter uh, raise your hand, let us know you're there. Um, that we have the applicant is Michael Beto. Do we have Michael Beto on the line? We do not, but we have Ed Block, who Ed is Block? registered to present. Okay. Mr. Block, do you have other um, people who are intending to present with you this morning? Do, can we unmute Mr. Block? Can Mr. Block unmute himself? There we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, Mr. Block, is there anybody else who's intending to participate with you this morning? No. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask you at the outset, do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board this morning will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And now, Daniel, could you read in the case for the morning? This is zone case 89 of 2020 for 1500 Latorte Street. The applications for a new emergency generator, they're requesting a variance from 916.06. Uh, the maximum permitted sound level is 45 dBA and 61 dBA is requested and a variance from 918.03.b.2. The required screening shall be at least 80% opaque and chain fence is requested. Okay, Mr. Block, um, you've, you've um, provided presentation materials, which we're putting on the shared screen, but could you explain a little bit about um, where the site is and what's being proposed? Yes, um, the, the, sh the drawing that you see is just a title sheet. If you want us to go to the next page, that's just kind of an old survey of it, but there's a, the next one is probably the best one as far as location. So this is an aerial view, uh, view overlay. Um, with the building, what you're seeing is the square boxes are on top of the roof. Those are based, those are the antenna well, sleds and the radio can, equipment. Can you just describe the facility first before we get to the boxes? Uh, the existing building? Yeah, what, what, what it's, um, we have it identified as the National Church Residences of Brighton Heights, but can you just give us a little description of what the building is and what it's used for? It's a residential um, apartment building, I guess, would be the best uh, way to describe it. Is it senior living or is it just a it's, residential it's, building? I, I think, I, I, I want to say it's just residential. Okay. All right. I, 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 again, I'm just curious, but. No, no problem. And uh, so but this, is, this is a proposal for an emergency generator. Correct. Uh, AT&T is putting a telecommunication site. We got approved for everything on the rooftop. So this was just the variance for the generator and the fence enclosure. Um, that red outlined area is kind of trying to help pinpoint the location of the proposed generator um, at the back of the building. And if you go down probably to the next slide, that's just kind of an indication of the size of the generator. Um, I think the best bet is keep going on the slides for a minute. And it's just an elevation view. This one probably gives it in that upper left-hand corner. Where we're placing this, there's already an existing generator that is providing backup power to the building. Uh, we were not allowed to use that or use the, any kind of a backup service from the building. Normally, if that's the case, then we don't install our own. Uh, so there's already an existing larger generator and there's an existing air handler unit, uh, the one with the four circles on it, uh, in uh, an enclosed chain link fenced area already. So ours is the darker outline um, for the smaller generator. 
And the plan was to just continue that same fencing um, with the chain link match what was there um, to try to do something to meet the code would obviously make it different than what was there. Um, if you want to go further, I think probably the best one oh, that gives you, yeah, that gives you the middle group of pictures. They're kind of uh, a little fuzzy because we were incorporate them into the drawing. Um, that gives you in the middle is the existing generator and the chain link fence. <laughs> that, that's helpful. Thank, th thank you, Daniel. That's, that's a good view, I think. Yeah. So you and would be, you would be essentially bumping out the chain link correct. fence that's already there. Correct. Yes. Okay. And the, um, is there just, if you could give us sort of a, a means of comparing, um, what would be the size of your gener generator um, as compared to the existing generator that's there? Um, it's, if he wanted to go back to... Uh, no, I'm just, does it, does it come yeah, out I, that I, way? I, it, I saw, the, I saw the, the site plan, but just... Yeah, in it, general, it's, I, I just say it's half size. Okay. <laughs> it's half the size. Of, I mean, that one is... Uh, providing for the whole building. Like I said, we're just providing backup for AT&T's radio equipment on the roof. So um, from, in terms of the generator's operation, um, the, the variances being requested are from a decibel level. So I'm assuming that the generator would only operate if there were a um, outage of some kind um, and it, could be that if if there's an outage for you, there's an outage for the building, and right. that the building's generator is going to go on too, right? Correct. So um, there's two two cases. One is when the outage occurs. Um, each generator has to be lubricated, so to speak. So there's um, a, a maintenance cycle. An I have, exercise I, I have, period. One would say. Um, I. Personally, I have a generator at my house since I live in the country. It's right outside my house, two feet, three feet away. Um, it comes on. We have it scheduled to come on at noon on Saturdays because during the day you have a lot of outside noise. Um, we used to hear it. Now it's kind of like, oh, there's that little rumble. Um, so what, what I think we sent a letter, we sent a letter along saying we will schedule this according to um, what is appropriate. And I think we said during the day as well, um, just because again, there's a lot of outside noise that takes place. I did include a document that provides what the sound level is for that. And it's, it's in the normal, I think it's one of the last documents not part of the construction drawing. This is, it, okay, there's a letter talking about the testing. So yeah, we're at the yeah. 60 level, 61 level. So you're talking about normal conversation sewing machine to television. So obviously we're, it's not a significant um, but, noise. But level. again, it's, it's for the limited periods of when there would be an outage. Absolutely. Where presumably, I mean, potentially the building generator is going to go on as well Correct. and um, during the exercise period which you would coordinate with the um, building owner yes and if, if you want to back up back up one slide to that one aerial Oop, one more i think that one uh, this is that one there um, may not be able to tell but the buildings you know just on the north side of that picture what I've done is I've got a little dimension in there. It's hard to see now. It was a red line, giving us about 30 feet from the generator to the property line. And as you can see from the property line, what is adjacent is a ball field, a baseball field. Um, and then you're 135 feet away from the actual closest building. So those noise levels diminish uh, significantly uh, by the time you get that far away. And I'm sure that anybody playing in the baseball field is probably not going to be um, bothered by a generator that might happen to kick on. We cycle ours for 15 minutes on, a, on each Saturday. Okay. 
Um, Zubin, I'm going to ask you for, uh, well, first board members, um, Mr. Richardson, Ms. Burton Falk, um, any questions for this applicant? No. And Zubin, do we have anybody else indicating an interest in participating in this hearing? No, we do not. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Block. I think we're going to close the record with this. Thank you for a very um, thorough presentation. It's really helpful for us to have pictures and measurements so that we can understand what's going on. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll close the hearing and uh, we'll issue a decision. Thank you. All right, thank you for being here this morning. Okay. So we are um, gonna move on to the second hearing of the morning, it being 9-11. Uh, the, the next case of the morning is zone case 95 of 2020 for 4951 Center Avenue. We have the applicant listed as Rachel O'Neill. Is Ms. O'Neill on the line? She is. Can we unmute Ms. O'Neill and uh, Ms. Kirk? Hello? Um, do, do you have others who are um, uh, participating in this hearing? Yes, we do. We have uh, Scott Petch from Winchester Thurston and we have Chuck Wooster from Wooster and Associates Traffic Engineers. David Kamen, I believe, is also on, but most likely will not need to testify. Who, uh, can, I, can I just ask um, who should be unmuted for the, for the hearing, just so that we have everybody? Uh, Scott and Chuck, and probably Rachel, she's the applicant. She, she filed okay. the papers, yes. Zubin, do you, have you identified all of those participants? I have not seen Scott. I only have Rachel and Chuck. Okay, well, we need, we definitely need Scott. Oh, um, is Amy? Yes. Okay. That is Scott. Yeah. Oh, okay. Otherwise known as, okay. Um, so, I just just because there are a number of you involved, um, I'm going to ask you all to swear in at the outset, and then we'll ask Daniel to read in the case. Um, so if you could be unmuted for that, we'd appreciate it. Um, do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board this morning will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. And. Um, it would be helpful for the court reporter and for us because some of you um, aren't appearing on screen um, to uh, just identify yourself as you're speaking. But uh, Daniel's going to read in the, the case first. This is on case 95 of 2020 for 4951 Center Avenue. The applications for change of use of existing two story structure to educational classroom space limited. They're requesting a special exception from 911.04.a.20. Special exception required for the educational classroom space limited in the LNC zoning district. Okay. Who's starting on behalf of the applicant? I am Ms. Meitinger, Dusty Elias Kirk. Thank you. So, and we have your we have your the pre-submitted exhibits on the shared screen. So if you want to page through that, or just give us an idea of what's going on. Okay, great. Thank you. So Winchester Thurston is leasing this property from the Katzellas Trust. And as you all probably know, this is a basically an office building. Well, we, we don't yet because we don't we don't have the. Uh, oh, um, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> So. And if, if there's a page that you want me to show, um, just let me know and I can okay. uh, scroll yeah, through. Yeah, I, I, would, I would appreciate some orientation. I, all, all we have is the uh, property address on Center Avenue. Okay, so this is off, from, off of Moorwood and Center. And Alice, you're probably familiar with it because it's where the, uh, there's a, a uh, antique store, I'd say retail. Uh, store right there on the corner. 
And it's across from the building that Pitt is renovating, if you know. <laughs> what what used the get to be there? Maybe that's the best way of describing it. What used to be there um, is the, well, it's still there. It's the uh, Mark, I think it's, what's the name of this, Scott? What's the name of the antique store? Uh, good question. It's Mark Ever, it's Mark, maybe, yeah. Is it, it, I, I'm just, is it the, it's near the, yeah. where the, uh, the um, old it's Reed Board Brothers building was, that was torn down? At that intersection. Yeah. So it's a, yes, there's a yeah, there's a bank uh, uh, caddy corner from there, okay. just up the yeah. street from Shady Side Hospital. I think we have another photo, um, Daniel, that might show. If you can, there you go, there Mark Evers Antiques. Okay. You, you, yeah. And Daniel, if you go to uh, PDF page 15, the property is outlined in kind of a gold orange. Ah, there we go. Yep, there we are. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. So, but so the 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 special exception being requested is to use a portion of this building um, for additional campus space for Winchester. Is that correct? It's actually to use the whole building and for okay. a, uh, additional space for Winchester, and under the your the code. It has to be for fewer than 75 students. So Scott can tell you what they're proposing to do if this is approved under the lease. So Scott, could you explain what, what you would like to do with this space and all the, all the tenants would vacate if this is approved? Uh, so the uh, plan for us, should we be able to acquire um, the lease here and, and begin using that space, it would add an additional about 14,000 square feet for us. Uh, the first floor would be primarily office space and we would relocate uh, administrative offices from the main campus there on Moorwood. Um, not all administrative offices, but some administrative offices so that that could be reclassified as a teaching and learning space in the existing buildings. Uh, and then the, um, the majority of the building, though, would be used for additional upper school uh, innovation spaces. And so uh, it would be configured in a way um, that we could, there would be movable walls, there would be so that we could have either smaller breakout spaces or one large space to do interdisciplinary work, uh, things around robotics. Um, we have uh, courses that are combining machine learning with social studies. Um, and uh, project-based learning so that we would have larger spaces for kids to work together uh, in that innovation maker, uh, in maker spaces that would be located on the, on the property as well. And for your record, Scott is the head of school at Winchester Thursday. Oh, sorry, <laughs> thanks. I was gonna ask okay. him to identify himself, but um, <clears throat> the, so it's 14,000 square feet, but but in the LNC, the educational classroom space um, limited is what what is the limitation to keep, you said 75, 75. people or 75 students? 75 students or less. And, uh, and this, could you explain how many students would be there when they would come and? Sure, so I, um, there would not be 75 students in there at any given time um, because it would just, they would be rotating in uh, two or three sections of students at most, which would probably be around 60 uh, students plus a couple of teachers. Um, and this is not for us to grow our enrollment. Uh, it's just to acquire um, additional learning spaces uh, as we continue to offer new programming uh, at Winchester. Uh, and so um, it's no new teachers. We're not expanding our, our staff. We're not expanding uh, student enrollment. This is really just um, new spaces that we need to do programs that, that we can accommodate um, on the, in the existing buildings. Okay. And, and um... I understand you have Mr. Worcester on the line, and I'm, I'm assuming one of the, path, the, the impacts and concerns would be, um, given the existing building, there's no on-site parking, um, but 
um, is, is it the intent for the students and administrators or office people who would be using that building would park on the campus or are there other accommodations? Um, is everybody gonna walk two by two down down Morewood to the building? I mean, what 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 is the plan there? That, well, that is exactly the plan. We do have adequate parking on the city campus um, between the two, um, you know, primarily behind the one building at 555 Morewood. Uh, and we also lease spaces, and I think that's included in the exhibits. Uh, we lease additional spaces. Um, Can you go to exhibit C, Daniel, please? Okay. And um, this exhibit shows the existing parking spaces. And so would you explain, Scott, is there going to be any change to that? There will be no change to that. Uh, and yes, so, so we would use these existing spaces. Uh, and and uh, administrators, uh, employees, and students, teachers would walk from those spaces uh, directly to the Center Avenue property. And how uh, would students will, get there? Uh, they'll walk directly down Morewood um, in between classes. Uh, we are planning to have, we have security at, at both, um, uh, in, in both existing buildings right now on Morewood. Uh, we will also be adding security in uh, the Center Avenue property. Uh, Can you so go back to exhibit D again, Daniel? That shows the path, the walking path. Uh, and so they will be, uh, they'll be supervised through security as they're going back and forth between these. And this is going to be primarily juniors and seniors um, that would be uh, traversing all the way over to the Center Avenue property. Uh, and it's probably less than a five minute walk. Um, and uh, be, once they leave the upper school building, uh, it would be a very short walk over to the Center Avenue property. And they would be there kind of typical school hours, um, roughly uh, the, the day starts at 8.15. Uh, they would check in in the main building before heading over to this property if they had a class the, the first thing in the morning. Uh, and then so parent drop off, all of that will happen at the main campus. We, there would be no drop off allowed at Center Avenue. And, and, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the, the, I think you've already explained this, but the intent is really redistribution of people, not the addition of people. That's so um, it's your position that um, even though it's an additional 14,000 square feet of space, uh, the parking calculation should be consistent with the parking that you already have because um, the addition of that space is not going to translate to the addition of people. That's correct. Okay. And it's an office building right now. And so Scott has already said that it will, the first floor will remain as office primarily. So um, with no additional parking. Is, is there a, um, a certificate of occupancy or anything that reflects that building's use for office without parking? I mean, in terms of the prior, because presumably the office use without parking is non-conforming. So is, is there any um, certificate of occupancy or anything else that reflects that? Um, I do not know that. I don't know, Rachel, if you know that. We did an informal search online and could not find a certificate of occupancy for this property. I'm sure that there is one, but it was not easily cataloged and, and identifiable. Okay. And can Chuck, Chuck, are you unmuted? Can you unmute him? I am unmuted. Okay. So Chuck, did you look at, did you look at- Could the you identify yourself for the record first place? Right. Yes, uh, Chuck Worcester from David E. Worcester and Associates, a traffic engineering consultant. So we have an exhibit with a letter from Chuck, um, and I believe that that is, and we have, um, he's looked at the parking, so I believe that that exhibit is G, but I don't know if you want to start with that, Chuck. Uh, I'll just... Uh, just give an overview of, of our letter. Um, my understanding uh, with the use of the school is uh, use of this space for the school is that um, it will not generate any additional traffic. And in fact, 
this reuse of um, 4951 center will reduce traffic um, because there is traffic associated with the existing uses, uh, traffic and parking. Um, those would be eliminated. Uh, so the primary issue here is, uh, I'll call pedestrian safety between uh, 4951 Center Avenue and the Winchester Thurston School. Um, we have a number of exhibits that are simply uh, photographs of the area so that you're familiar with it. But essentially we walked back and forth to make sure that we could have an, an adequate pedestrian path and whether the pedestrian accommodations um, associated with that walking route are adequate. Um, That's exhibit, I, exhibit E, I think, Daniel. Yes. There, um, as you see, even from the photographs, and these were done in, in March, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but they, uh, uh, they, so this is, um, that's the intersection at, at um, Morewood and Baird, um, indicating that there are existing pedestrian crossing uh, indications that's right adjacent to the school. Um, that signal's also encompassed within uh, a school zone um, that operates uh, from 7.30 to 8.30, 12 a.m., um, 12.50 p.m. to 1.40 p.m. and from 2.30 to 3.20 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. So that, uh, so that we have, uh, uh, there are pedestrian accommodations, handicap accommodations, uh, all of that that exists at the traffic signal adjacent to the existing Winchester Thurston School. Um, the, uh, the walkway uh, that's depicted in the, in the one figure between the school um, on the east side of uh, Moorwood is actually, um, uh, does not cross any other public street, does cut, cross some private driveways, um, but has no intersecting streets. They can traverse all the way from the existing campus to the intersection of Center and Moorwood. Um, Can you go to, to the what, next set of pictures then? Yeah, yeah. To what will actually be a, a, a newer traffic signal. That traffic signal is going to be updated as part of the, um, the uh, project that Pitt is undertaking at that intersection. And the photographs I have show that the intersection, actually some of the streets were, were, were blocked or changed as a result of their construction. But I contacted the traffic engineer um, that performed the traffic study associated with that project, who assured me that as part of that project, all of the traffic signal equipment at the intersection of Center and Moorwood is to be updated to um, uh, pedestrian with with pedestrian accommodations, countdown traffic signal, uh, countdown pedestrian heads, um, uh, and new vehicular head, so it'll be a, 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 a new say the art traffic signal system. And one um, more, one more set of pictures, I think. Yeah. And that's, you could essentially see, I mean, you can see almost to the intersection from the school. Nearly, it's less than a thousand feet. It is less than a five minute walk, depending on whether you're talking on your cell phone or not. Um, <laughs> and, but it, it is, it is a- Trying to ditch a, school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It, it is a it is a uh, it is an easy walk. It is uh, uh, there's no significant grades. Um, the conditions uh, are are more than adequate. Um, there are handicap accommodations. There are uh, marked uh, pedestrian crossways. So um, it was our conclusion that we have a a, a post uh, update of the traffic signal, which should correspond to the development of this building. Um, uh, it's more than adequate for the, uh, for the uh, students that will use it, students and faculty that will use it. So it's actually from the, from the city standpoint, a benefit, um, a benefit reuse because the traffic associated, traffic and parking associated with 4951 will be eliminated. It'll all be encompassed within the Winchester Thurston School. So could you explain that a little bit? Why, why do you say that? Well, there's, there's currently an office building, an antique store. There were other uses within that building that currently generate traffic, that currently park likely on center or within the environs of that building. 
um, that demand will no longer be there. It'll be just absorbed into the existing um, uh, Winchester Thurston School parking area because they're not going to have additional staff or additional employee or, uh, students associated with this development. So essentially the, whatever is being generated in that building today will be eliminated and simply um, an expansion of space through a pedestrian walking area um, will be beneficial. I think um, I just have one other question um, for Scott and it just in terms of uh, the, the security and I understand it's a safe pedestrian walking, but um, from your security perspective, is there sort of if if a student checks out with the intent of going to the um, expansion space, is there somebody checking in at the other end to um, confirm that student A who's checked out has arrived safely at the destination, the intended destination? Yeah, so we take attendance every period. So if a kid has been in the building for, um, you know, let's say they're, they're scheduled there from 10 to 11 in the morning, uh, if they were in the, in, the, on the, uh, in the main building at eight from eight to 10, and they've been checked in and we do that all electronically, uh, mm -hmm. and they do not check in, for that next class that would take place uh, in the expanded space, uh, then we would have a way to check it to see if they've um, gone, you know, taking a little walk somewhere. Um, I, it's never happened before in the in the history of high school juniors and well, seniors. And never at Winchester about. Thurston. Okay. Uh, is there any other um, testimony or evidence that the applicant wants to present? Because I think yeah. we have a pretty comprehensive application package. And then yes, the next I, question. Sorry, go ahead. Is there I additional say, evidence? I, I do not think so. I think you have everything. We, we gave you a pretty robust package. And um, Ms. Burton Falk, Mr. Richardson, any questions for the applicant or the witnesses? Madam Chair, I think we've covered everything. OK. Questions. All right. Um, Zubin, is there anybody else on the line who is interested and would like to participate, um, present comments on this application? No, there is not. Okay. And we did post the building and you have those pictures. I know it wasn't required, but you Well, I was going to say, it, it, it's a whole brave new Zoom world, so. Right. Um, Thank you, thank you for for your presentation. I, it, again, it, I think it's helpful and comprehensive, and we um, it, it, pictures always help. So, thank you all. We're going to close the hearing for today, and the board will issue its decision within the time permitted. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. -bye. All right. Um, the next hearing of the morning is zone case 97 of 2020 for 2400 Smallman Street. Um, do we have the applicant identified as Rob Fathman? Is Mr. Fathman on the line? He should be able to speak here shortly. Okay. Yes, there I am. We go. Mr. Right. Fathman. Do you have um, others who are participating with you in this hearing that we should be identifying and unmuting? Yes, we do. Um, the owner's uh, representative, uh, James Mogg. All Craig right. Koza, who's a development partner of the owner. And Bob Gatz from Trans Associates, our transportation planner. Did you say Craig Koza? Correct, Koza, excuse me. I always mispronounce his last name. Yeah. Okay, there's two Craigs, so we'll just try one of them. All right, do we have um, Craig Koza? I think everybody's muted. Craig, we, we have somebody who's just identified as Craig. Could, are you intending to participate in the 2400 Smallman? Okay, we've got another Craig here. <laughs> Could you identify yourself for the record, please? Just so that we're sure that we have the correct Craig. 
Okay. Craig Kaza. Am I unmuted? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay. All Great. right. Yeah. So um, I am going to ask everybody who is going to participate in this hearing um, if each of you would swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I guess. Yeah. All right. And yeah. I'm going to ask Daniel to read in the case so that we understand what it's about. And uh, um, and then who's who's going to take the lead in terms of the presentation? Uh, Jim is going to introduce the project, and then I will uh, walk through the presentation with Craig and Bob. Who who is I? Who is? Oh, I'm sorry, Rob Hoffman. Okay, sorry. thank you. All right, <laughs> Daniel, could you could you read in the case, please? This is Zone Case 97 of 2020 for 2400 Smallman Street. The applications for a core and shell renovation and fit out of an existing structure into retail general, recreation and entertainment, indoor limited, restaurant general, and public assembly, assembly limited uses, exterior work including masonry, new windows, and storefronts, outdoor seating deck, and rooftop HVAC screen platform. They're requesting a special exception from 911.04.a.5. The public assembly limited use is, requires a special exception in the RIV IME district and a special exception from 914.07.g.2a. Special exception requested to approve off-site parking. Should I read the rest? Okay. All right. Start away. Okay. One second. I'll bring up your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I you might go to slide eight just to orient everybody. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Which slide? Um, it looks like you might have the old slide deck. I had sent a new one through that was shorter. Um, okay. Um, I might have missed that. Uh, could you could you try and resend it? Um, okay, sure. Well, um, what, can, can we work with what we have? If you, you can... probably can work with what we okay. have. Yeah. yeah, if you give, if you give me, um, yeah, just let me know. You know, I'll, I'll be able to find the slides for you. What What is your email? Uh, my email is Daniel Shep dot Shepke at Pittsburgh PA. Oh, yeah, you I, sent it have it. I sent it to you the other day. I just sent it to you. Okay, thank you. It's smaller, takes less time. Okay. <laughs> But can, while we're while we're getting the other slide deck up, can you um, yeah. just describe generally where the property is and what's being proposed before we launch into everything else? Sure. I, I th Jim, do you want to give a quick introduction to? I, I do, Alice. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My name is Jim Mogg. I'm the director of uh, maintenance for uh, Pitt, Ohio. The owner is uh, Chuck Hamill, who also owns this facility. Uh, in looking for this facility, um, it's centrally located in the Strip District. Um, you may know that we have numerous facilities in the area. Um, in purchasing this building, it's 2400 Smallman, we wanted to develop it as a community asset. Um, upon purchasing this uh, facility, um, we're partnering with uh, Craig Coza, um, who has other pro bike and run uh, facilities throughout the area. Um, to make this an asset for the general community. Um, you may know we have numerous facilities also to support the parking uh, that's required for this. Um, we've elected to use the hub, um, although we have other backup facilities as needed. Um, I will also be overseeing the general construction. I'm in the area. So our contractor, Rycon, who's also a um, local um, contractor, we will be overseeing them. So I'll be available um, almost all the time. Well, what, what is actually proposed? I mean, what, what's the use? I mean, it, the public assembly is pretty broad. So right. Rob, do you want to handle that? Sure, I'd be glad to hand that. So um, when, when Chuck Hamill met with Craig Coza, the, the idea of putting a cycling center into this building um, on the ground floor, um, it was Craig's uh, and Chuck's idea to create a small event center on the second floor to support um, the need for meetings in the Strip District. So, for example, if you're working at Apple and you want to have a, a, a meeting 
uh, of your staff um, and be able to have a social space. There's a cafe in the building. Um, the idea is to make it a social hub for the building. I'll let Craig talk a little bit more about the internal uses because he's basically going to be operating everything inside the building. So, but, but just so I understand, is the um, pro bike and run that is that retail, but then this event space on the second floor? Yeah, if you go to slide four, I, if it's in the new slide deck. Yeah, yeah we have yeah, the new, new slide one. deck up. Yeah, go slide four. Um, that summarizes the use in the building. Okay. So the total lease areas are above and then the square footage before below. So you can see ProBike takes the predominant space on the first floor. There's a bike repair shop in addition to that. And there's a small cafe, cafe, coffee shop. All of these things are integrated into one space. If you've been to their North Hills facility, it feels like one space. It's a, it's a much more of a, a social feeling to it. The conference meeting space is on the second floor. The distillery pub concept is in the basement. The basement has 16 foot high ceilings. It's a spectacular space uh, made of the historic ruins of the old buildings on the site. And then next to that is a fitness studio. And I have some plans to show you that if you need them. Yeah, let's let, let's look at how the space is being used. Okay, so uh, uh, slide 13. And so this is the basement level. We'll go up from the bottom up. So these, uh, the basement of this building, um, as I mentioned, has 16 foot ceilings. It's actually built on the remains of an 1850s building, this beautiful brick arches. And it's a wonderful uh, sort of Batman cave space. Um, so we're bringing fire stairs down into it. Um, it'll have a coffee roaster, the pub and the fitness studio in the rear section you can see in blue are the toilet rooms and uh, locker rooms for the fitness studio. So typically, as Craig can describe, you know, there are um, bicycle cycling clubs and people coming here using the locker rooms and then going out for a ride as part of their social activity of riding uh, in groups. Um, the next level um, is the ground level. The, because it was a loading dock facility, what we're doing is adapting the two levels from the street level, which you can kind of see in the middle there where the word retail is that's at the street level. Those existing garage doors will be transformed into new garage doors in glass. There'll be a, a new canopy over the uh, entrances. And then um, to the right is uh, a new monumental stair and an additional sales area that's up a half level at the old loading dock level. The elevator uh, remains where it is and has all the ADA access directly from the center of the building throughout and access to the whole facility. You can see our service dock in green there to the right. That will also act as a place for you to drop off your bike and take it to the repair shop. So we have a really good synergy there between service and repair. Um, there's a small bathroom in the bathroom that, uh, in the back that supports the retail area. And then the cafe in pink to the left, which about borders on to Smallman Street. And that's right, if those of you are not familiar with that location, there's an existing dock there and old railroad siding. It's right across from Wiggle Whiskey. Um, so that will, um, we've applied for an encroachment to build, uh, extend that existing dock across that face. And that will be at the level of the cafe. And you'll see that in a rendering in a moment. Um, the next level um, is the meeting space. And what we've done there is really kept this as open and as flexible as possible. Um, there are Basically, this used to be warehousing space, and it's similar to what you would see on the upper floor of the History Center, for example. Um, you've got exposed wood and, and steel. Um, we're adding an existing a new stair for exit capacity and toilet rooms, and then there's breakout spaces along the uh, east property line um, along the back and a catering prep area. Um, Mr. Hamill has uh, kitchen facilities, as you may know, across the street in the parking garage in the uh, Osteria 21 facility. There's a large kitchen facility. And so that will provide additional support um, to the building for events, uh, basically be able to take uh, catered, you know, uh, materials into the, into the building. So that, that's the extent of the building is three floors, 9,000 square feet each. Um, and uh, take a quick, uh, let's go to slide number uh, 16. I guess it'd be the next one. This just gives you an overview of the overall facility. Um, the um, building is being completely rehabbed. Um, brick is being repointed, new roof, uh, new mechanical systems. There aren't any now. 
Um, one of the new additions is the rooftop units. As you can see there, we've highlighted those. We've uh, had a conversation with auto, the Auto Condo Association, and we have also met with the strip neighbors and received their support. Um, we are uh, making sure that all of our equipment is state of the art in terms of acoustic performance and separation. We're also going to be working with our engineer to make sure that the uh, coffee roaster does not produce too much coffee smell in the neighborhood uh, using a filtration system uh, down in the basement. Um, so the, that gives you a pretty good sense of the overview of the project. And uh, I, but the, 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 we need to touch on the parking. I'm assuming that's what yeah. you're going to move to. So yeah, there, I was just going to hand that off to Bob and okay. uh, we can go back to, um, let's see, Bob, I guess we can go back. You can slide number three. Um, has a basic summary there. You have the full report. I just excerpted it here. Okay. And, but the, and Bob, you can summarize that. Yeah, I was going to say, without reading through the whole report, right. Um, right. there was a determination made that 33, 33 spaces would be required to support the proposed uses and com combination of uses. Yes, that, that's correct. And, th and that's taking into account um, some prior use of the building. I mean, it, it there, there has never been on-site parking for this structure, right? No, no, there hasn't. And so, but the, 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 how did, how did the, how did we get to the 33 requirement? Okay, and I can walk through that. Um, as Rob described, the uses in the building, what we did is broke it down into uh, three uses, the public assembly space on the, on the top floor. And uh, we calculated a, um, a maximum occupancy of that space, which would be 277 persons. And uh, in the uh, zoning code, uh, public assembly requires a uh, separate demand study. So we looked at some national sources and we based it on a uh, source uh, for public assembly space that uh, it, uh, essentially said uh, you needed uh, 0.4 space per, per uh, person. And uh, so that works to uh, 70 spaces. From the 70, the RIV district uh, allows you a 50% reduction. So that dropped us to 35. Uh, the next use was the retail space, the pro, pro bike and run space. Uh, that worked to, um, of course, one space per 500 above the first 2400. That required five spaces, off, off street spaces. Uh, again, RIV allows you 50% reduction. Rounding up gives us three. The last use was the restaurant spaces in the building, the bar, the brew pub, and the cafe. That's one per one, 125 square feet above the first 2400. That resulted in uh, 15 spaces. Again, 50% reduction for RIV gives us eight, eight spaces if you round up. This is all, by the way, in the exhibit, uh, the parking study is on table one. So if you work through all the numbers, um, with the 50% reduction, uh, you end up with a total uh, demand of 46 spaces. Two of those would be re ADA required spaces. Uh, of course, the ordinance allows up to 30% uh, further reduction if you um, have uh, bicycle spaces on site. And so many of those protected, of course, it's pro bike and run. So we have a few, few bicycle spaces on site. So if you drop yeah, that down, just, can I can I stop you for a second? The with the fifty percent reduction um, in for the RIV, it also allows for the thirty percent reduction for bike parking. I I believe so. Yes. Okay. It's and is that an? I'm assuming that's an interpretation that um, staff has accepted. Yeah, I know this went to DCP and uh, they uh, agreed with our, our calculations or numbers. Okay. And I saw nothing to the contrary in the ordinance under bicycle parking that you were not allowed to take this, uh, this reduction. Okay. It's just a, a, a question that, that I want to confirm. So we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. But so we're working with the 33 number, but the proposal is um, to have some of the to to have the remaining parking need being addressed off site. So can you explain where the off site parking is proposed? Yes. Go to slide six. 
Yeah, so within a, a thousand foot radius of, of the site, and again, that's, that's per the zoning code, uh, you have uh, three rather sizable off street, off site parking facilities, one right across the street at 2340 Smallman. Uh, that's 179 spaces. You have the court factory garage, that's over 400 spaces. And then the, uh, the hub garage uh, up at uh, 20, uh, 26th Street, and that is 588 spaces. Uh, the applicant and owner of this facility has an easement in the hub garage for uh, 30 spaces. And I believe that was, that's an exhibit also. So um, it, the plan is, of course, because he has an e exclusive easement, recorded easement uh, for those spaces, um, employees, uh, et cetera, could par uh, park up there. That would be within the 1,000 foot walking distance. But there's certainly enough other uh, lots, public lots in the garage that you could park within uh, 1,000 feet. And we did um, pre-COVID days back in uh, October of last year, we did uh, parking accumulation counts for the 2340 Smallman lot and also the Cork Factory lot. And they're in the, in the uh, parking study as well. And what we found was on a typical weekday um, under normal conditions, uh, there was never less than 200 spaces available combined in Cork Factory, uh, Smallman Street, and Hub Garage. And then on a Saturday, there was over 500 spaces available in those three facilities. So we're, we're pretty confident there's enough parking in the neighborhood and even in the immediate area to, uh, to support this use. For the, for the uh, special exception for offsite parking, it does require recording the agreement. So I understand that there, there, there's an easement arrangement that would allow for 30 spaces within the hub garage, but is it the intent to dedicate those 30 spaces to this use? Yes, uh, yeah, that's my understanding. Okay, All right. Um, any, any other information that the applicant wants to present with respect to either of the special exceptions being requested? Uh, we do, this is Craig Kaza. Uh, mm -hmm. We have 53 spots um, on site, bi bicycle parking spots. Okay. I know that's in there as well. Um, and, and this is really about the neighborhood and the community. It's about the people that live there. Uh, so it's the people that live there, the people that work there, that's what this facility is for and it's supporting the community. So there'll be bike concierge there, or there'll be all that it's really promoting everyone walking, running, riding um, you know, with the proliferation of, of e-bikes, people can actually commute all over the city when they might not be able to. So really making use of the greenway, the bike trail, all that. So it's a very strategic and um, we hope no one needs a car coming down. I was going to say, so in That's some the ways, goal. the automobile parking requirement is offensive to the very use. <laughs> it is. It is. I saw the new. I saw the new residential code, and it was like, hey, no, we may not have to have parking in certain districts. And I'm like, yes, that's where we need to be. But, but yeah. Okay. But that's that's the plan. We want more people on bikes, running, riding, walking. There'll be run clubs, ride clubs, all that. Just really supporting the community. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Richardson, Ms. Ms. Burton Falk, um, any additional questions for the applicant? No. no. Um, Zubin, do we have anybody um, on the line who wants to participate in this hearing? Yes, we do. Firstly, we have a Tony Araujo. Do we have, are you unmuted? I believe so. Can you hear me? Yes. Could you identify yourself for the record, please? Yes, yes. Tony Araujo. I'm president of the Auto Milk uh, Homeowners Association Executive Board. We are the next door neighbor to this uh, project. Okay. Can, can you explain what your um, position is with respect to the project? None. I'm just a neighbor with a, a couple of questions and reservations. Well, that, and that's what we'd like to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Rob was kind enough to reach out to me a few days ago, uh, very much appreciated and explained the project. And uh, I just want for full clarification, I think I can support this project with a few reservations. Um, I can't speak for the entire condo association because uh, we did not take a poll on that. I just want to put that out there because I know we've got other auto milk uh, residents here. 
The main question and concern I have, and Rob touched on them a little bit, and I appreciate that, and I have confidence uh, that they're going to make the attempt, but noise, if, can you go to slide 16 by any chance? This kind of gives you a little perspective of uh, where my concern comes from. You see the auto milk condos there, that's us. The big west facing wall uh, where the text auto condos is actually written is just a short distance from um, the areas of concern for me. The air handling units on the top, the air conditioners, um, I talked to Rob about that. I was wondering if anyone um, of the development team could uh, you know, provide any kind of information on that, on the noise. The other thing, and to me most concerning, um, the third floor of the units, uh, or sorry, the third floor, or which, which would be the event space, is um, I'd like a little more clarification if possible on what type of events might be held there. Um, if you look back at the auto condos uh, figure there, that side of the building is, is bedrooms. Um, literally bedroom windows. The bed, uh, windows aren't depicted there. It's not a brick wall, it's, it's windows and, and uh, balconies. So I, like I said, annual meetings, corporate meetings, meetings with Apple, that's, uh, that's not a problem. I'm just wondering if they could give any kind of clarification on uh, maybe after hours events. I, I'm concerned about uh, weddings, private parties. I'm a wedding photographer, nothing against weddings but I know that they're loud when you introduce large groups of people and um, live music and DJs. Um, I don't get the sense that this is that kind of space where they had planned it, but I'm just wondering if they could provide any kind of clarification on those two things, the air handling and the um, event space. Thank you. I, this is Rob Foffman. I can talk about the air handling and then I'll ask Craig to talk about the event space. Um, the air handling units um, are designed with the, all the state-of-the-art uh, attachments for acoustic reduction. And we are also putting a screen, or a solid screen around the equipment, as you can see there in, in dark red. Um, the distance between the air handling units at the center and the auto milks building is about 56 feet. Um, the um, air handling unit equipment um, catalog cuts we are gonna share with you, uh, Tony. And um, that does provide some information that shows that the uh, pro project will meet city code for the decibel levels um, that are required, which is I believe 60 dB at night. Um, and so obviously uh, the air handling units, of course, uh, run at different speeds depending on the time of day and, and the, the uh, temperatures. There's also a small yellow um, stack you can see there um, um, right above the word TPO, and that is the exhaust fan for the, um, the coffee roaster. So um, we're going to use a HEPA filter down in the basement that will provide the proper filtration of the odors uh, and particulates from the coffee. So we, um, as we talked uh, earlier, Tony, we will provide all the technical information for that and make sure that we use the best possible practices for sound reduction from the rooftop. Yeah, and, and this is Craig Taza. I, I mean, additionally, we, we always want to be very sensitive to neighbors because it's a community asset and a, a, lot of, a lot of the auto milk, and this is part of the auto milk complex actually at one time, but um, the, the driveway helps the separation, but that whole rear wall on that third floor um, Rob, there are no windows on that wall. Yeah, correct? if you go to slide yeah. uh, 15, um, well, Tony and I talked about this. We we basically are putting all support services along the back wall. There look like there are windows on the left hand side. There, they're actually going to be bricked in, so there will be no um, active windows on that side of the building, um, except for the bathroom windows, which will have obviously translucent glass. But um, in terms of noise that might occur in event meeting space, let's say you had a band that's going to be in the center of the building and a couple of rooms separating that plus a very thick brick wall. So um, we, we can certainly make sure that oh. there's no leakage of sound from that sod. But, but Craig, may, I'm, this is Alice again. I, yes. I, I, um, I have a question about the hours of operation for the event space. Uh, sure. How do you intend to have um, a scheduling uh, matrix or 
um, I, no yes. later than midnight on Saturdays. I mean, do you have an operational plan for use of that space? Um, and the, the question about it, is it in a, in a pre COVID um, scenario, we might say you're intending to pack as many people in as possible on sure. a, every night of the week. I'm thinking that's not the reality right now, no. but um, when you're when you're talking about events and meeting space, it, is it one large event a month? I mean, what what's the general plan? It, it's it's a, a lot of it is for the tech companies during the daytime when they need to do retreats and escape and they can kind of ride bikes and have coffee and then do sessions and then come back out and kind of work back and forth. Um, there will be evening events as well. Th this place is it's not it, there's it's not going to be a nightclub. It's not going to run nightclub hours. Um, it'll be reasonable hours. I'm not sure what the city code is, but you no, know, we're doing it at North Park now, and I don't think there's been anything past 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, and, and what we do up there. So we want to follow the community and everything, but we also want to take an abundance of caution with that solid brick wall in the back here. Um, and then it's, it's also going to be, oh, we wanted to keep the brick, but Rob's like, no, we got to insulate it. So we're actually going to insulate and stud out that entire wall additionally. Um, we also are putting all new roof insulation in, um, and Rob can speak to how thick that is, but that's going to be a big noise barrier as well. Um, so I think we're just trying to be super cautious because we don't want, I mean, a lot of the people in the auto condo building are gonna be our customers. So we certainly wanna be a great neighbor, um, but it, it's really intended to kind of follow what's happening in the strip everywhere else. Um, and it's accommodating the tech companies and the, and the people that live there and, and, and all that. That's what this is for. In terms of capacity, I, it, you were the, uh, traffic engineer spoke to uh, occupancy for that space and it's 200 some. Um, so presumably you couldn't have more than that right. um, for any given event. That's right, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you have any other um, questions, Mr. Arau? Um no, I just, you know, I appreciate uh, the efforts that they're making. Um, my main concern, like I said, is live bands and that thumping music at midnight. It doesn't sound like that's going to be the case. Um, and, and, but I know, and we I have a full basement. If, if that was to happen, we can just make sure any of that happens down there, you know? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. reassuring. That's reassuring. Um, construction is my last concern. Um, we, we live in the strip. We've been, you know, undergoing construction here, which is, which is all a good thing. The development's fantastic, but it's, it brings a lot of noise. Understand that comes with the territory. Um, I believe the city ordinance is 7 a.m. I'm just trying to be a little proactive here and just- So, just, and, just and, and I have to say, I'm gonna cut you off here because yeah. um, construction issues aren't before the zoning board. Okay. And we would certainly encourage continued dialogue with the developers to discuss issues like that. But um, the, the board doesn't take into account uh, construction issues. Very well. Thank you. Okay. And I, I, if there are no other questions that you have, um, there are other neighbors who um, would like to participate. And I want to make sure we hear who those are. Zubin, do you have other people with raised hands for this? Yes, somebody listed as PowerLink. PowerLink. Could you unmute? Okay, uh, I unmute it. Identify yeah. yourself for the record, please. My name is um, Harry Edelman. I'm a resident in Auto Milk. I'm actually the closest balcony to the roof and elevator, existing elevator tower on the building. And so probably my concerns are best addressed on slide 16. Um, the, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the coffee roaster stack because that is the position where the wind comes from that aims at and hits the auto milk building. And I'm curious if there's any way that can be put somewhere else may be closer to the Argo. I understand that's a plumbing and all kinds of other issues, but that would be a concern because that's the direction the wind comes um, in. 
Yeah, th this is Rob Foffman. I can answer that question. Uh, my, uh, I, I'm in the Benedim Trees building on Market Square, so I, I can smell the coffee roasters and the bacon and eggs in Market Square. I totally understand your concern. Um, what we, uh, unfortunately, the location of that uh, stack has to be relatively vertical. In other words, we can't run it horizontally. Um, right. It's a fire hazard building code. Um, so the way to solve this problem is a filtration unit, and we'll send around a catalog cut of the unit, but it's basically a filtering system that is uh, attached to the coffee roaster to uh, eliminate the particulate and the smells from the roaster. And um, the Mechanics Coffee, one of the partners with Craig Coza, is actually the distributor for that system. So we'd be glad to sit down with you and go through that and maybe even find some examples to demonstrate that it will work. Okay. Um, the other question I, or concern I have, Tony addressed some of the noise issues, and I can get together with Tony as far as, you know, the noise issues, but the previous uh, drawings that were shown in the Post-Gazette about two weeks or three weeks ago showed that the screen around the HVAC would be, if you're looking at the front of the building, would be on the right-hand side of the elevator stack. If you look on slide 18, that's that's the view it was used in the Post Gazette. Okay, and the if there's another one from the other direction, um, I don't have it in the set, but we do have one. Um, because okay, another happened, seven, oh, 17, slide 17, excuse me. Yeah, what happens is if you look at it, that dark red jumps from both from one side to the other on the uh, existing elevator shaft. Correct. And, but it doesn't seem to wrap around it. If we could go back to 16 again. Yep. Um, so my question is, is, as far as the height of the screen, but also the distance um, that it extends from the elevator pit towards the cafe deck. Do you know what that distance is? So, um, so it's the, first of all, the, the screen is the same height as the existing elevator penthouse. Okay. Um, and um, what was the, your question about the other distance you're looking for? When you're looking at the uh, front of the elevator shaft, there's a, there's a section that's about the equivalent of two windows wide that is towards the cafe deck, towards Smallman Street. I'm just right. wondering how far you're gonna, because basically you're starting, you're blocking my view. I see. Um, yeah, we, we've tried to keep this deck as tight as we can. The two air handling units are driven by the volume of air inside the building. And um, we need a certain clearance around the air handling unit. So those screens, we've tried to keep it as absolutely as small as we can. That's technically the smallest footprint we can make with those two units. Um, can, the but foot, they, can the footprint be moved toward Argo a little bit? Uh, the problem is that the duct work, it's, it's a very complicated thing. But if, if you go to slide um, 15, for example, um, the ducts have to go straight down through the building. You can see there are these white X's below in front of the elevator and in, in front of the stair number two. And they have to go straight down in order to get the di distribution duct work. So it was kind of the, it's the optimal location for the mechanical penthouse as a result. The air handling uh, duct work actually feeds straight down through the, the, the roof. I mean, my concern is that, you know, I feel like you're damaging my property value by putting it right where it is. Uh, I mean, we're doing the best we can to minimize the size. And, and I think we, we appreciate your concerns, Mr. Edelman. We, we certainly understand um, your, your request for clarification here. Um, did you have any other questions that you wanted to present to the, to the board for the board's consideration or for- I, I really, I wanted to understand it um, a little better and uh, possibly Rob and I could get together and I could show him the balcony view and we could, you know, look at some things. We, we but I don't that. have any additional questions. Okay, thank you. Because are, are there other um, neighbors who would like to participate in this proceeding, Zubin? I don't see any more neighbors, no. Is there, is there anybody else who is raising their hand to participate in this proceeding? No. Okay. Um, 
Mr. Richardson, Ms. Burton Falk, any additional questions for the applicants? No. And, and we do appreciate the efforts of the, the development team to coordinate with Auto Milk, and we would assume that those con, uh, conversations continue, um, particularly with respect to Mr. Edelman's concern and the concerns with respect to um, noise um, and the, the operation of the event space. So um, we, we would hope that those, those uh, con continue. And if you have any updated information based on those conversations, we would we would consider that as well. Okay. All right. Hearing hearing no other voices on this one, we're going to close this hearing and thank you for your participation. Um, we the board does have forty five days to issue a decision, and we will um, issue a decision in accordance with the, that requirement. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. All right, uh, the next case is uh, zone case 120 of 2020 for 939 West North Avenue. Uh, the applicant is Vince Finizio. Do we have Vince on the line? We will in a second. Thank you, Zuba. Hello? Mr. Finizio, yeah, how are yes, you? Yes, hi there. Hi, you can hear me? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. You're okay, you won't be able to see me. My camera doesn't work, but that's okay. It, it's our loss. Yeah, um, it, exactly, exactly, yes. I look uh, better than ever, you can be are sure. You, are you the only one who is uh, presenting in this case? No, we have the uh, representative of the owners, PJ and Steve Neugebauer, and uh, we believe we have uh, Sally Stadelman from Councilman Wilson's office, I think. All right. You said Steve, Steve, and or PJ, or they. I, I think they're together. Yeah, Steve. Uh, he, I see he's Steve, it. and I see Sally. Okay, I believe that's everyone that I know of. Okay, we're going to um, ask you all to swear in for the case. Um, you swear or affirm that the information that you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. And um, Daniel, can you read in what this case is about? I'm so sorry, Daniel, can I, I, I actually, I, I am on standby. It's actually Councilman Wilson that's going to be speaking this morning. Thank you. Well, we're, we're, we're starting. So we'll get him, get him in the room. Um, but Daniel, could you read the case in please? Yeah, this is zone case for one, uh, 120 of 2020 for 939 West North Avenue. The application is to re reconfigure an existing parking lot to create accessible space and new dumpster enclosure. They're requesting a special exception yeah, from 912.02.a.4, change in use to another non conforming use, sales storage uh, to warehouse and office, and a special exception from 916.09, additional commercial parking located in a residential zone. Okay. So who is going to start on behalf of the applicant? Okay, well, I'll start. This is Vince Finizio. I'm, the, I'm their architect. I'm just going to say very briefly, I, I submitted this uh, narrative, which you can read at your leisure. But very briefly, uh, this is a longstanding business uh, that has been there for 20 years in this, you doing the same job. It's a print shop. It had been a print shop for about 30 years before that, before they purchased the building and set up there. So with that, I will defer to the owners. So and Explain is a there bit. is there something that we should be looking at? I, I understand we have a narrative, but we don't. I don't know where the building is or. Uh, um, well, we have a plot plan. Uh, okay, that's, that would yeah, help. We're, we're not doing a lot to the exterior of the building. All we we need. Well, I can give you a brief rundown. Uh, Do we have any photos of the existing building or um, anything that gives us a sense of the site location? Because um, all we have is nine thirty nine North Avenue, West North uh, Avenue. I would say if we could go to the plot plan. Uh, uh, yeah, well, there, there it goes. Yeah. We have the plot plan, right? No, I just have what you submitted. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you had yeah. the plot plan as, because that's what we submitted to, to do the, uh, huh, to do no. the. Yeah, I mean, okay. if, you, if, you, if you have it handy, you could email it to, to me. I, I do, I do. Okay. 
Uh, see, I have to <laughs> figure out how to do that. Okay. Well, basically, In the meantime, it's it, it, can 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 somebody explain what the proposal is? Yes. Why don't I defer to the owners, PJ and or Steve, and they will uh, explain to you. Uh, uh, what they want to do and what the building is about and what they want to do. Basically, what they want to do is continue what they've been doing for, you know, 20, 20 years and what the building has been doing for going on 50 years now. So uh, I'll be with you in a minute. Steve, PJ, if you guys want to chime in. We, we need to unmute Steve. Uh, I don't know. I assume they can hear you. They've been listening in. Uh, Steve, can you hear me? Uh, there, there's somewhere on your computer. There may be an unmute screen. There we go. Screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We got. All right. Steve, I, could you identify yourself for the record, please? I'm Steve Nugabar. Okay. Vice, and, Vice President. But, and can you just explain the the what's being requested here? You're um, reconfiguring the the building. Yes. We have to reconfigure the building for the permit for the occupancy permit. And right now we're 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 uh, dealing with the parking lot and the parking lot's been the 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 way it's been since we bought the building twenty some years ago. And we're trying to keep the parking lot the same way as it was when the other owners were here for thirty years. So that's that's the whole issue what we're doing right now. So it's it, it, the what you have in your certificate of occupancy doesn't match up with what is actually going on on the site. Is that what you're saying? Uh, we're going to defer that to Vince. Uh, yes, it's an old the certificate of occupancy. You know, this is unfortunately all too common in the city. It's from 1963. Okay, with Sher Sherwin Williams facility. Uh, and that's just the way these things go. Of course, they bought the building. No one said boo to them about needing to, to redo this. Uh, they've been using the parking lot as is, and you know they were never, no one ever, they were never made aware that there was any problem. So they just continued to operate their business in good faith. Now, some building code issues have come up, which we are addressing, and that triggered the need for, for this hearing here, basically. That's, uh, that's okay. So. Um, it would be really helpful to have a photo or the site plan to show where the parking is in relation to the building. And if you could explain how many parking spaces and um, okay. improvements you're intending to make. Okay, I'm sending that in right now. Okay. Um, let's look at, uh, I don't know how long it'll take you to get it, but swap shared screen. Okay, I got to expand here if we could go to the, well let's start with the building plan a1 until you get the okay uh, it's a big square industrial building basically and it takes up most of the lot if you look at this plan just to the left about a you know 50 feet to the left is the parking lot and the rest of it is all right to the lot lines okay uh it's a it's um, mostly one story. And if you look at the section above that little bump that sticks up is the second story. Everything in the crosshatch X area is, is the office function and the rest of it is the print shop and, and storage function, okay? So the second floor is used for offices. Um, the middle section of the first floor is used for offices and the left part is the, bay. those are the interior loading bays, the garage, three bays there. Uh, on the left lower corner and the right area is pretty much the print shop area. Um, uh, do you have the, Daniel, do you have the uh, email yet? I just sent it in. Yeah, I received your email. It, it's taking just a second to, okay, all right, yeah. so it'll be up so in a sec. So so tell, us, tell us how many, so the parking area is on the same lot and how many spaces are involved? Yeah, okay, well, in, in a second, I hope he can pull up the plot plan, which will explain all of that. While, I, while I'm here, I will tell you there there's a, if you look at down in the middle of the first floor, just right in the middle, there's a door we're showing there. That is a new door. And as part of the building code upgrade, there there turns out there is only one exit from the second floor. So we had to add an, another exit. And that so we're adding that door, which just goes out to the street, to North Avenue, other than that not really doing anything to the exterior of the building at all. 
All the other changes are just interior, code upgrades, accessibility upgrades, uh, that sort of thing. So do we have a plot plan yet? No. Uh, yeah, sorry. It, take, it takes a second. Sorry. The email okay, server does some security thing. It, okay. So it, Vince, yeah. I'm looking. Uh, I'm looking at the site, and where the parking spaces are, it looks like it's also showing three very large uh, garage bays. Is that accurate? Yeah, they're inside. Yeah. Yes. Right. Correct. Okay. So from that parking lot, you've had existing uh, garage doors. Um, correct. And and I see a dumpster. Okay off there in the parking lot as well. Correct. Well, I will say as part of the reconfiguration of the parking lot, we're gonna move that dumpster into the upper left corner and screen it. Mm. Okay, so what we're doing basically is uh, the, the striping is there. It's just kind of ad hoc. These guys did it to, to bring some or, you know, when they bought it, it was just the blank asphalt, okay? <laughs> they, they put the striping in, uh, just to bring some order to it and it works. Uh, we understand that it doesn't meet the the zoning standards for clearances and lanes and all that but it, it works and and they do feel they need this number of parking spaces for the em employees that they have in here if they don't uh, have the spaces then they'll just have to take up spots on the street that's be to be realistic the alley behind is too narrow there's no possibility of parking there um and again it's been this way it's not like they've been hiding anything. <laughs> it's, it's wide open. It's been there for 50 years being used this way and all the neighbors are aware of it, it hasn't really caused the problem. So, and uh, the bottom no. line is I, 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 I am interested in, in moving along, but the, the, you're not proposing any, any changes. No, well, the only changes, uh, I, 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 I apologize for it. I didn't realize I had to include the plot plan because that was part of the original submittal. But if we could look at the plot plan, the only changes we're really proposing are we're changing the striping in the parking lot to accommodate an accessible parking space. Okay. And we're moving the dumpster. It was in the middle of the parking lot on the left hand property line. We're moving it to the back left and we're putting a screen around it. Okay. So it will no longer be visible to the to okay. the neighborhood. So you're okay. If you had a, a pre-existing non-conforming condition yes. on the site, you're actually getting it closer to code by um, having the ADA spaces and having the screen dumpster. Correct, yes. Okay. Um, and do we have um, Councilman Wilson on the line? Uh, looks like Sa I see Sally's thing is muted here. Uh, we have Wilson on the line. I'll okay. unmute. So let's 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 hear the councilman's position with respect to this project. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Can you hear me? We yep. can. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks. I'm I'm on this platform a lot, but it seems that uh, you all have a different. Uh, I, I like how you control it. I, I appreciate it. So uh, I'm Bobby Wilson. I'm the councilman, uh, and um, so this is a uh, councilman for District One. So this was a priority for me to come to the zoning board this morning to offer testimony on behalf of the business in my district. Uh, this, this business is called Process Free Productions. And I'd like to implore the zoning board to approve the continued use of the building as a non-conforming commercial use in a residential zone. So the owners, they've been operating out of this building at 939 West North, as you've heard several times here. So we, I think this is something that you know, everyone's been harping on is that this has been going on for 30 years and the building was purchased uh, by the new owners in 2008. So recently and, one of the owners, what's that? I was going to say, Councilman Wilson, I think we understand the nature of the request, but from your perspective, it's something that you're supporting. Um, and is there uh, the the improvements that are being proposed, moving the dumpster and restriping the, the lot, um, those are consistent with with your support for the project is that is that right yes and yes i'm you, in support i'm in and I, the, the other question i had was um have you heard any expressions of concern from your constituents or um other people in the neighborhood who who um may not be as supportive and have expressed concerns to you so as far as i i so i have been uh you know, I've been the councilman for some short time, uh, but it's um, 
you know, this, this was my third try at it. So I've been at these community group meetings uh, for quite some years. So Allegheny West community meeting, uh, this business has never brought, been brought up from the, you know, 30 some meetings that I've been to throughout the years. But, but nobody, there are definitely there. Nobody has approached you with respect to this um, proceeding this morning and said, hey, you know, please oppose this from the, from the councilman's perspective. No, no, okay. not at all. Okay. Not at all. In, in fact, I, I, I didn't even realize this business was here until they started getting into these problems. So they've been a very good business, very good partner with, they do a lot of printing for um, Allegheny uh, General Hospital and other local uh, businesses. So this is important for, for our community. That's fantastic. That we're, we're, we really appreciate having your voice um, on in this proceeding. Um, just quickly, do yeah, we I appreciate the, all the I appreciate all the updates that they're doing. What's that? Did um, did we get the um, the site plan just so that we can look at it quickly? Because I think we can move on from this okay. proceeding. Well, actually, you know what? I think I think actually I need to resend that site plan here. Just so a minute here. We're, we're I tell you what we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we look at it. Um, okay. Dubin, is there is there anybody else who is indicating an interest in participating in this hearing? No, there is not. Okay. Councilman Wilson, thank you so much for being here this morning. Steve, Vince, thank, thank you. you. Okay. And, uh, thank you. We, I'm we're sorry. We're going to make sure that we take a look at the, the site plan so we can see the specifics of it, okay. but I think we understand I, the, I, the name. Yeah, I have to apologize. Can I clarify? There are a number of site plans, and the one I'm sending in now dated April 12th is the one we want to look at because that does show the increased number of parking spots. So it was a long okay. go around. So I'm going to send that to... Daniel and Zubin now, and please look at that one, okay? We will, that, we will make that the, the record site plan. Thank you. All right. I think okay. uh, unless, unless there are any other questions from the board, we're, we're going to move on to the next ones. Okay. Oh, thank thank you. you. All right. Uh, the, the, okay. the last four. Hello, hello, done. Okay, the last four cases um, are related and have the same parties involved and I'm going to recuse from all four cases. Um, so I will turn it over to Mr. Richardson and Ms. Burton Falk and enjoy. Who wants to start? Sorry, I was on mute. I'll start. Um, who do we have for this case, Daniel? So we have a Cliff. Oh, there's Cliff. Cliff, do you have anybody with you? Yes, I have Jeff Boyle, uh, Chuck Kennedy, Mike Spagnoli, and I believe they Desiree Lucente. Are they all on the line now to be sworn they in? Should be, uh, they should be on the line. Jeff said, Boyle. Like, Mike Spagnoli and Desiree? Yes. Okay. I and then Jeff them. Boyle and Chuck Kennedy. I see them. Do we have everybody zooming? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, do you all swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. All right. Yes. Daniel, can you read it in, please? This is zone case 113 of 2020. I believe the address is wrong on the agenda. This is for 2100 Smallman, correct, Cliff? That's correct. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. So this is for 2100 Smallman Street. Uh, the applications for a new roof-mounted business identification signs. They're requesting a variance from 919.01.e. Sign may not be mounted above the roof line or parapet. Proposed sign extends above roof line. And variances from 919.03.m.6.a, maximum 80 square feet in sign face area permitted and 324 square feet of signs is proposed. Maximum four foot letter height is permitted and five foot eight inches is proposed. And tenant signs are to be located within the facade of tenant and proposed signs are above uh, passageways. And I'll show your presentation. Let me know if you want me to change the page or um, zoom in or anything. One second. Okay. 
Okay, who would like to begin? Um, I will start. My name is Clifford Levine. I represent McCaffrey Interests. Um, and I owe uh, Commissioner Burden Falk a short hearing here after a previous long hearing. So I'm going to try to do my best to do that. Um, one thing that would help, these four cases are related, so it would make sense to just have a consolidated transcript so I don't have to reintroduce everybody. I think that would uh, cut down on the work. You can issue separate opinions, of course, but I think just having a, that consolidated transcript so I don't have to worry about repeating would cut some time. Okay, I'm um, fine with that. Does the court reporter understand that? Uh, I believe so. When you say consolidated okay. transcript, please clarify what you mean. Well, the next four cases, this one and the next three, are all um, related, same parties, uh, same attorneys. Um, so we will indicate when we're ending one case and beginning the next. But for when you generate the transcript, they can be uh, considered one transcript. Will we be re-swearing in different groups of people? Uh, Not on this case. We have the same witnesses for all four matters. Okay, I no, understand that. Yeah, it should be all the same people. So we won't re-swear anyone gotcha. unless somebody new jumps on. And if, for, if someone wants to right. comment on a particular case who hasn't been sworn in, we will swear them, but I don't expect that. Okie doke. Okie doke, thank you. Okay. So let me just give it just a, a quick overview. So the Prado's Terminal, everybody knows it. It's an iconic building in the Strip District uh, that sits between 16 and 21st Street. Across the street is a building uh, we've called 1600 Smallman Street. It's a, a, a large uh, uh, 70 foot high or so uh, uh, red brick old warehouse. Uh, both those buildings have been acquired by McCaffrey Interest based in Chicago. And the Prado's Terminal in particular has been a uh, significant project with lots and lots of uh, difficult issues. Everything you can imagine in terms of financing and historic review and zoning and floodplain, et cetera. Um, but they have worked uh, quite diligently, worked very closely with the URA, with uh, the mayor's office, and um, are now in the process really of finalizing the construction of this project, which is basically, it's a single, for most of the length of the building, it's a single story. Uh, it's been substantially uh, rehabbed. And then at the end towards 21st Street, there's a two story um, portion of the building. Uh, so I think just as a, I think you're familiar enough with this, the first witness I would like to introduce is Jeff Boyle. Um, and what, what this particular case is, is simply about having identification signs that are gonna be on the rooftop because it's a one story building, but also reflecting that historical feel. And so I'm just gonna ask um, uh, Mr. Boyle, if, if we can get Mr. Boyle. And so I can ask him a few questions. Um, good morning. Um, I, as, uh, um, could you speak a little louder, Jeff? Just so- Or raise your microphone level by yeah. the lower left-hand corner. Let me see. If you click on that pointing up arrow, you can adjust your volume. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Can you hear me better now? Yes. Good. Thank you. I'll leave that to the court reporter. So just jump in to the court reporter if you can't hear him. Mr. Yeah. Boyle, can you just identify yourself briefly, your role uh, and, and McCaffrey's uh, general involvement in a brief overview? Um, First off, my name, as we've said a couple of times now, is Jeff Boyle. I'm managing director with McCaffrey. Um, I, I've been working on this project for the last many years. Uh, Dan McCaffrey and the team uh, uh, won a competition. I believe it was back in 2012. Um, uh, the URA had advertised for redevelopment of the Protos Terminal. Um, we've been working that long <laughs> through the approval process and also the construction to finally be in a position to uh, um, open the facility up um, in um, September of this year. So it's been a, a long path, uh, one that's we've worked not only with the, with the city of Pittsburgh, but also with uh, the state historic uh, preservation group, uh, SHPO, 
Well, let me let me just ask you a quick question about that, just so we have a context. So uh, this the strip district is a federal um, historic district, which is different than a locally designated district. As uh, right. I guess as Com Commissioner Burton Falk, I don't want to uh, do this too much. We had a similar case uh, uh, a short while ago, um, but this is a federal district, and so the the Prados Terminal, as is the sixteen hundred Smallman Building, are both contributing buildings in the federal district. Is that right? That's correct. And as a result of that, um, there's no limitation on what you could do in terms of if you wanted to uh, change or alter a building, unless, of course, if you accept monies and uh, from government money. So in this case, the project did receive some monies from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, correct? That is correct. And as a result of that, that invoked SHPO's involvement. And SHPO is the Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Office, which is called uh, SHPO, S-H-P-O uh, for short. And so among other things, you would meet with SHPO officials and have discussions about what kind of design the building would have. And, and why don't you describe the, the nature of those discussions uh, generally uh, with the board and then as it may relate to the signage question. Well, yeah, I, as a matter of background, just um, for those who don't know, uh, McCaffrey interest has been involved um, uh, in the Pittsburgh area for a number of years, having renovated uh, the cork factory uh, building lot 24. Uh, so we have um, as a matter of, of course, uh, a great deal of involvement and uh, history in doing the renovation of uh, historic building. But uh, SHPO was as um, collaborative as they could have been. Um, there has been um, uh, many discussions leading up to uh, where we are today. If you were to go out there, the, uh, the, the color palette for the painted areas, they, um, they have worked with us knowing that we have to have a successful redevelopment of taking the historic wood doors that were on the produce terminal, uh, refurbished uh, the, those that st still existed when we took over the property and they're being rehung on the uh, north side of the building, the spruce way side of the building. Um, uh, it has, um, we have run past them this uh, proposal that we have now in front of you for the, uh, the sign um, that will be, we believe, extremely important to the marketing and the iconic nature of- And let's just go, if we could go to the next um, shot of the- Yeah, there you go. Uh, Daniel, are you can control it? <laughs> yeah, let me know if you, um, which page you want me to display. Okay, um, so this is, what, no, this is one. What page is this, two? I can't, you're- yeah, I'm on two now. On two. So um, just, just I think everybody at the board understands where this is. This is uh, two, just shows the location of the strip district of the building. If you could go to three. Now, this is the zoning overlay map. So it's completely in a UI district, uh, number four. Um, that just shows the locations of the sign, uh, which we can get back to. Uh, but one is the at, at the left. There's a green, two green points. So one is at 16th Street and one is at 21st Street. Um, so you can see the the green is is around uh, between 20th or 19th, and then the other one is between 15 and 16 or 16 and 17. Excuse me. Uh, next page. Um, so that shows what the sign looks like. I think uh, that's some of the dimensions that, and we'll get back to that with the architect. Um, next page, please. Um, this we'll discuss with the architect just about how it's affixed to the building. Next page, please. Um, so this is a rendering of what the sign would look like in the back support, and we'll have some discussion uh, with the architect. Um, but first, the uh, next page, please. Um, I'm sorry, go one more. I think the old, okay. So there's a photograph, and, and this page, again, I'm sorry, the, the page number is blocked, Daniel, if you could just Read that for the record. Uh, page nine. Page nine. So, um, uh, Jeff, if you could explain the, this rendering and what it is and, and how that uh, played into your discussions with SHPO. 
Well, as I um, said earlier, um, it's very important for uh, us personally to um, uh, be respectful of the history um, of, of the buildings we're renovating, um, but we also have the, the need for success in the development also. We, this was the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad sign that was up at uh, 11th and Smallman. So I just want to note to the board, um, just to be clear, this is not the building at 15th or 16th and 21st Street. It, apparently there was a sister building that looks like it was designed by the exact same architect. It was. And this was at 11th and Smallman in a picture from 1941. Yes. Um, as you can see, the sign that was mounted here was on the roof of the structure um, and uh, certainly had a high level of dominance, not only from uh, the view that we have uh, that we're looking at now, but all, all the way around the building. Um, we try to be a little more subtle in our um, sign placement on, on the project. Uh, as you'll see from that section that we- In the next, the next slide, Jeff, in fact, you looked at other national markets that you were trying to emulate. Yeah. Can you describe the, the this the next photograph of uh, identification signs? So we have Union Market in Washington, DC. And as you can see, uh, um, Pike Place in uh, Seattle, that again, um, her, our, uh, using the dominance of the sign to, to uh, um, uh, draw attention to the development, certainly, but uh, I think in, in the context of, uh, of what we think is good taste. So, uh, um, uh, but there is certainly precedent across the country for these kinds of uh, signs to be identifiers for the project. Okay, and so the, the, the project that you proposed for the terminal is similar to the Union Market in Washington, D.C., in the Public Market Center in Seattle in terms of being a, a, a urban-based mix of a lot of retail, small shops, local businesses, and showcasing um, just a vibrant urban uh, market feel, I guess. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, yes. Okay, and so and so you took these designs and you the design that we saw uh, with the terminal, that was a design then that as part of your discussions with SHPO and, and creating the historic feel for the building, that was um, one of the signs you presented and, and what was their reaction to that? They, they, they were uh, fine with it. They uh, thought that it was in, in context, so. Um... And um, let, let's go back, um, Daniel, if you would, to the, the, the placement, there was a, a about the, Exhibit for four or so, I think, showed the green locations. Just, oh, yes, right there. So it shows the uh, the building uh, identity signage and where this is located. And can you just describe why there's two signs and why it is you're you're thinking that it should be in the locations that um, you've indicated? Uh, did you ask that of me? Um, uh, or we could have Chuck talk about that too, either one. Uh, let, let, let me put this, I, I, I believe, I'm assuming the, uh, most uh, on this, uh, this hearing uh, are familiar with the building, but let me point out, and um, we have three passageways through the 1600 foot long building. And um, those are commitments we've made to the city and those passageways at 17th and 18th Street with, with the most left and the center one um, <clears throat> uh, go connect Smallman to the river walk pathway system that goes through the Buncher development to our north. So um, we had originally located the signs, the two signs at the 17th and 18th Street passageways, but we're concerned um, that we, as you can see, if we were to do that, um, they are really oriented towards the center of the development and not as balanced as we believe they needed to be in order to be um, um, noticed and, and, and recognized as the, what we intend to be the very iconic um, component of the overall design. So 
the green locations is uh, is the proposed locations. So you'll have one and what's referred to as phase one. So and we'll that's have, the one by between that would be between 16th and 17th Street. Is that right? And then the other one that will be between 18th and 20th Street. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let me call Chuck Kennedy just to go over a couple of the issues associated with designing this. Um, is Chuck available? On. Okay, thank you. Hello, Chuck. Um, can you briefly describe uh, your name, who you are, and where you work, and what your role in the project was? Sure. My name is Chuck Kennedy with Antunovich Associates. I'm a uh, senior principal and uh, principal in charge of the project. So if we could show the rendering of the drawing, I, I, uh, Daniel, I think that was, uh, go back. Okay, well, that's the, that's the concept. So let's look at the concept because I think, let, let's go back to the one with the terminal. So tell us about when you were, you were involved in helping design the signage and how it, how it would look, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. I think uh, Jeff touched upon uh, quite a few of the points about being uh, historically in context. And uh, we looked at a number of buildings across the country uh, of this vintage, the 1920s, uh, specifically 1929. And uh, it's fairly prominent. You find it on the Santa Fe building in Chicago. Um, we saw a couple other examples in Denver and uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, also uh, in, in Hollywood, the Knickerbocker Hotel and a few others. So we wanted this sign to uh, match the period of the building. And that's why you see the exposed structure, the individual letters. And then we have uh, uh, flood lighting, which will light the opaque letters. And as a practical matter, uh, describe to the board the challenges of designing a sign for a very public space on a one-story building that extends for five blocks. Well, that's the whole point. It's a unique building that's five blocks long. And we have uh, created a number of elements to break up the building. Uh, we've highlighted the passageways already, which helped to do that. And uh, we have purposely located these signs uh, separate from the passageways to also create uh, another focal point. Now there's a canopy that we see. There's a canopy that we see in the building. Is that, is yeah, that it, actually, if you go to the, I think it was the slide before with the section. Yeah, on the right-hand side, you'll see a canopy that's about nine feet off of the raised dock. And uh, that extends the length of the building. And then directly above these that, we were have elements, by the way, And by the way, these were elements that Shippo wanted to keep in the building design, right? That, that's correct. These are existing elements that we are refurbishing. Okay. So tell us about the challenge of locating a sign when you have the canopy uh, in general in a one story building. I think it may be obvious, but just state it briefly. Sure. Uh, we have two elements we want to deal with pedestrians that. Uh, are walking on the sidewalk and automobile traffic. The uh, canopy tends to block any sign uh, from view if you are walking or driving on the lane there. So we have located the sign uh, above the low parapet of the building and uh, that increases the visibility. And it's noteworthy, there's a parapet that would be to the northern portion of the building. Like to the back of the building, if you're looking at it from Smallman, correct? Yeah, so plan left of, or of this drawing that you're looking at now, the building pops up and uh, the roof is sloped. So we are, the top of our sign would be slightly above the high point of our roof. And so it's literally one foot, nine inches comparing the top of the roof to the top of the sign, is that right? That's correct. And so given, and given that the, the structure of the building, it would be impossible to see that sign if you were on the north side or behind the building. Uh, that's correct, ready. from Spruce Way or the uh, development uh, to the north of us, you will not see this sign. 
So the, you, the only you, ones I'm sorry, uh, Cliff, I have a question. Do, do you have a rendering or of what that would look like from the other side uh, to support what you just said, that it would not be visible? I'm just curious. No, I don't believe so. But no, we do not have a rendering. But just uh, just to put this in context, there's a row of um, a buncher and some related developers have put in townhouses that are three or four stories right behind this building. Yeah. And so there's and there's a parking right behind the building. So that'd be on the north side towards the river. There's going to be a parking lot. And so you would be at the townhouse level. And so if you're if you're not in the townhouse, the townhouses are going to block that view because they're about the same. They're, they're taller, actually. Mm. And so if you're in the townhouse and you're at eye level, when you look over, you would you would see the parapet would be blocking that. And so, it, you know, you the parapet is solid. So you would you would see you wouldn't be able to see that sign. So you wouldn't you wouldn't see the back of the letters that say the term. Exactly. Exactly. Now, conceivably, if somebody's on the fourth floor looking down they might just catch about a mm -hmm. half a foot of the top of the sign that might, yeah, this easy. building this building is symmetrical basically from this drawing so if you flip it mirror to the left it's the uh, same basic layout okay thank you and so the the way this building is designed too there that's the the reason for the pedestrian easements uh, so the 17th and 18th Street uh, are going to have these, and, and 20th as well, but notably 17th uh, and 18th are going to go right through to the river. So in the Buncher development, uh, 17th Street and 18th Street are still active. And so those are the passageways um, that people might uh, traverse that way. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I think and we could offer that if you'd like, but it's, if you can see it's the dimensions and maybe we'll go back, I think um, Daniel, the, there's a shot or two before that shows a um, layout of the street, I believe. Uh, this is a good example. I think this, this particular exhibit shows the, the townhouses. So you see where the townhouses are and then in relation to there's parking and then you can see the width of the building. And so the parapet is actually comes up and makes it almost like one and three quarter stories or one and a half stories or so. So the parapet is blocking and then the um, the signage is then in front of the building. So you really wouldn't see it, the parapet. You're just not gonna see that at all. Um, and then one other point, Dan, or Chuck, can you mention, if, while we're looking at this, the there's actually a two-story building as we go towards 20th and 21st Street to the right of this particular sketch, is that right? That's correct. The two-story portion is just to the right of that rightmost passageway. Okay, and so this signage is obviously gonna be lower than that, um, that height. Yes, that substantially is. lower than that. Okay. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I think that that's, that's uh, really the issues. I don't know if Chuck, if you had any other points that you wanted to address, but I think you covered them very well. I think we have. Um, so I don't know if the board has any particular questions in addition. How, how much relief are you seeking on the size of the lettering again? And can you provide some um, evidence or testimony to support that uh, request? Okay. Um, so let me pull out the... Uh, so the... Normally, you would have an 80 foot, 80 square foot uh, face area sign. And this one is 324 square feet on top. And normally, there's a maximum of a four foot letter height permitted. And this is proposing a five foot eight proposed lettering. Are you the, at 324 with the two combined signed, or is each sign 324? Uh, Chuck, why don't you address that? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, uh, th that would be each. Each sign is 324? Okay. If we could go to the slot, couple slides before maybe, there's a not direct elevation that shows, up. Oh, the other way. There, there you go. Okay. And, and Chuck, just 
describe then how you came to this dimensions and why this is the appropriate dimension in your view as the architect and trying to meet the well, story. With this building, it's all about scale and the fact that we're 1600 uh, feet long. Um, we need this to be as visible as possible. And uh, in doing studies of looking at uh, uh, the views from traffic from across the street, um, you know, certainly the, the, I think the developer would like this sign twice as big. Uh, we're able to talk them down uh, substantially from that. And I think historically this is proportionate to what we would see on other buildings of this size. And part of it comes from the, so, so a lot of it, it has the uniqueness of the building that it's a five block long building. And then you have a canopy, so you can't have signage on the face of the building. Basically. Yeah, the other, the, the other point I wanted to mention, Cliff, was that uh, you can see in this drawing, we have storefronts, we have that uh, canopy that's directly above the storefront. And then above that, we have a row of continuous clear story windows. And then um, we have our parapet. The parapet is broken up by pilasters that are proud of the building. And then further beyond that, we have another continuous row of clear story windows. So there's really no place to locate a wall mounted sign. And again, this would be more appropriate for the vintage of this building. And if we go back to the, there's a photograph right at the beginning of it, the um, packet. Yeah, and I think the, that uh, shows the, the rendering. And that, that, so that shows the parapet in context. So the parapet is already essentially the height of the signage. And we, we indicated it would correct. be a foot, one foot, nine inches more, but it, the parapet then essentially blocks. And the parapet's about how deep? Looking at that, it's well, well, how many I, feet I, thick. If you go back to the section, we can look at that a little more clearly, I think. I want to understand what you're asking, Cliff. So the parapet, I'm just section. trying to get, trying to show how you basically put the, this, you use the parapet uh, dimensions almost to form the basis of that sign in terms of its ability to block and seems to. Right, we were, we were trying to be respective of the height of the building as well as the neighbors to the north of us by not extending significantly above the roof line. Okay, and the, the parapet blocks that. So it's really, um, and so, so uh, uh, Mr. Richardson, it's really has to do with this unique uh, five block historic building it has to be on the rooftop. And there will be other signs that will be business signs that are smaller. And so you wanna be able to differentiate that as well. And frankly, it's also to try to create this iconic look that was the historic look of, the, of this. We believe this building, we have the, the picture of the sister building at 11th uh, and Smallman. Um, but this was the style of that era, which we're trying to duplicate, and it's prevalent in other urban markets and, and becomes a, a more of an iconic. We want this thing to look like it's been there in its current form for many, many years, for 100 years or so. Okay. Thank you. So with that, and if there's no other questions, we can move to the next case. We can move to I think uh, just so that we clearly identify on the uh, transcript that we're closing that case number and we're beginning the hearing on the next case number. Daniel, would you want to read the next case in? Yeah. Uh, this is on case 114 of 2020 for 2100 Smallman Street. Uh, the applications for the proposed tenant canopy signage, they're requesting variances from 919.03.m.6.c. The maximum letter height is eight inches permitted and one foot four inches is proposed. And the face of such signs shall not project above or below the canopy and the proposed signs project above the canopy. So this involves the same Prados terminal building, but now we're gonna talk about the signage for the stores and I'll, I'll defer to Chuck here to walk us through that process. So here we're asking for a maximum letter height of eight inches are permitted and we are proposing one foot uh, four inches. And um, the face of these signs will be projecting above and below the canopy um, or will be above the canopy. So that's the issue we're gonna, so we're, we're gonna um, present why we have to have the signs 
the dimension that it does and what the canopy does to the placement of identification signs for the various businesses that we hope to occupy this five block building. So with that, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is again, the same uh, building location, which uh, 16 to 21st street in the strip district. Next slide um, shows that this is also in the UI zoning district. Next slide. Uh, this is again, the same building and this this is sort of an open-ended request because we don't exactly know how many signs there will be, um, but we wanna have uniformity in the signs. And as you'll hear, as tenants come in, tenants have a certain uh, preference and say in terms of what their sign is and what their branding would be, but we're trying to create a uniformity in terms of location and dimension. And that would be along the canopy to the front of the building, which is on the south side of the building facing Smallman Street. And again, because this is on the canopy, again, none of these signs would be visible from behind the building. It is really to serve the pedestrians and the traffic right on Smallman Street. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this will show, Chuck, um, why don't you take over here and run through how you've designed the signs and what the effect of the canopy uh, is in terms of that design choice. Sure. Um, so what we're looking at here is a partial elevation of the Smallman Street elevation. And uh, we have depicted some signs mounted to the top of the continuous canopy. That is the location we are suggesting for the tenant signage. So we don't know, as Cliff said, how many or who the tenants are going to be and each of the tenants will eventually apply for their own sign permit. Um, if we go, I believe, to the next slide, there's a section. So, you know, uh, we're limited to an eight inch sign height, which is very limiting uh, visually from across the street or even driving along Smallman. We have those same situations I described previously where we don't have a lot of wall area to put tenant signs. And we have the canopy that tends to block the view. So this uh, section shows how very small the canopy signs appear. And if we were limited to the eight inches on the face of the canopy, uh, they would uh, not be noticeable in any significant way. And, and, and Chuck, the, the issue with the, the canopy exists and we, we're keeping that and that's part of the historic look of the building. It's one we of the have main basically it's storefront, it's storefront below the canopy, so it'd be hard to place it there. And then if you locate it above the canopy, the canopy would actually block the view if it was actually affixed to the building. Is that right? That's correct. And then we have the glass clear stories that we're contending with as well. Okay. So let's There's go to the next, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this uh, is actually what you're looking at here is the two-story auction house and the canopy overlaps uh, on the left side you see the uh, the yellow and green lines and then the separate one at the center of the building is the uh, entrance canopy and let me while we have the i know we we uh for the benefit of mr richardson's question earlier on on case 113 um I note that to the far left of that sketch, there's the parapet over the one-story portion of the building. See that? Yes. And then we, we described the two-story building. So the signage is basically the equivalent of that parapet uh, in height and then would not be exceeding the two-story building. And that That's correct. And the, and the tenants extend underneath the left side of the two-story auction house you see here. Okay. Uh, next. Next uh, photograph, next. And what are we looking at here, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, again, this is the uh, east facade of the two-story auction house. There's an existing canopy. And again, we're asking to place the signs above the canopy. Okay, and then I believe the next photo would show that what these signs, or that there's one more, this is one other location. This is the north facade of the two-story auction house. There's an existing canopy, and we're pro proposing to um, put the signage above the canopy. Is that facing the parking lot? That faces the river? That's, that's correct. Okay. And, and that's just at that, uh, I believe, just at that one location. 
uh, on that on this particular building. Is that right, Jeff? That's correct. The canopy. Okay. Next. This is let's a just, let's, 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 let's go back. Let's go a couple forward just so the board can envision what we're putting up there. So, okay. So describe that there's a photograph of, uh, we have a number of signs that are above canopy. So describe how those relate to what we're proposing here. Sure. This is a number of retail locations that have individual letters mounted to the front edge top of the canopy. Um, various styles of, of letters and as as Cliff had mentioned earlier, the tenants will drive the the actual design of the sign to match their brand. Well, let's go the, back. the tenant will have to use its own lettering style, for example, or something like that. That's correct. Yeah, I, as I'm sure you know, uh, most retailers, whether they'll be local or national, have worked very hard on their branding. So <clears throat> color, um, letters Font. Yeah. are all are all part of their 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 retail package, if you will. Auto vary. Yeah, so that'll yeah. so it could be like the, the way these vary a little bit, and then you know whatever. But it's really the the dimensions, and then they're being placed right above the canopy. And so if you go back a slide, it shows. I think it was the one slide before for Chuck and describe. So you can see that the, the uh, end of the canopy is, is to the right of that sketch. And then Chuck, why don't you describe how you have to then place this uh, on? So we're, we're holding back off of the edge of the existing canopy, a, a, a small dimension and uh, mounting directly to the roof structure with the individual letters. And again, then instead of at the eight inch, I think you indicated that you really couldn't see the eight inch um, and you can't look at it on the wall because of the historic nature of the building, because of the canopy. And so uh, do you view the one foot four inches as the minimum height necessary to adequately even see the, the locations of these various stores and the identification site? Yeah, I, I, again, I would say that one, one foot four or the 16 inches is fairly minimal. Uh, we probably would, other tenants would probably want more, but we're going to limit it to this size. We think this is tasteful, proportionate, and uh, stands separate from the existing fascia of the historic canopy. You have somewhat of a unique condition in, in that it's a long contiguous building, but yet you have a lot of uh, exterior breaks. And I'm assuming that uh, rental or leases may take up one or two of those potential breaks. Is that accurate? And by breaks, I mean, um, Daniel, can you go uh, back a few pages? Uh, you know, that might be good there. So you, you may have a tenant here where you have the great outdoors where you've got more than one potential set of uh, Larger the bays, the bays, they're actually bays would be from the, historically in the building, they had these little bays that you pick right. up products. And that's right. actually the unique condition there is that you've got these sort of, uh, you know, they, it, it breaks in the building, uh, but it may not necessarily break in the tenant space. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, we don't know specifically yet how the leasing will end up on the building. Right. But the, uh, there'll be a number of smaller local tenants that may take one bay, but then we might get a tenant that takes uh, an entire phase, which, which a phase is broken up by passageways. Right. And uh, so there might be some locations that appear the way this drawing appears with two small tenants, but there, there may be one tenant that takes this entire facade. Right. And to follow up on the commissioner's point, the um, one of the challenges, we have the pedestrian access on 17th and 18th Street, and you're really directing people to the store and traffic. And it, it, it's not a shopping mall. It's not like you go inside. We want it to be external. And so you really have to identify and let people know where they're going on a five block long um, stretch. So thank you for That's that. That's correct. I have a question. Um, 
I understand you don't yet know what the tenant mix is going to look like and how many bays, you know, each particular tenant may take. Um, if a tenant takes several bays, say two or th you're depicting a double bay here, you know, I guess potentially someone might want more than two bays. They're still only going to get one sign. Is that right? Is there is there any concern that they're going to want larger signage because they've got a large a longer facade that they need to cover? No, we're just requesting. So we're requesting, this is the size we're requesting. So like, as you see in the great outdoors, how it's spaced in yeah. this particular example, it's spaced between, uh, what do you call it? Two bays or spaced four in the middle. windows. Right. Yeah. So, so my, I so guess that, the what, only, I'm, what I'm getting at is like, you know, you're not, you or the tenants aren't going to come back to us later and say, you know, the great outdoors, for example, isn't going to come back and say, oh, we took four bays. We need, you know, a bigger sign, larger lettering, because we've got such a large facade. I mean, they're going to be limited to whatever we approve in connection with this. Right. I mean, that would be our understanding. I mean, there might be some exceptional situation. The one thing I would want to qualify is that to the extent there's a tenant who is occupying two sides of the building. So for instance, that's could be the case at, at the far end at 20th and 21st street. So there might be a signage on the, on the Smallman side and on the 21st street side. So in that case, you might want to access. They're the occupying building. from front, all the way from front to back. Right. North to south, right. Inside that building, they might want signs on both sides. That's, That's right. right. They may have entrances to the uh, retail. Mm -hmm. on both sides. So. I got you. Okay. Yeah, I understand. But the back, we don't have the canopy issue like on the north side with the parking lot. So those could be smaller. That's not the, that, that's not the front, uh, front yard of the building, if you will. So right. there might be some very minimal identifications so people know where they're going, but it would just be on the auction house, which is at the 20, 20 and 21st street. That's the only one that we, we were showing a, a potential sign on a canopy on the north side because th there's a canopy there but that would be the only one. Right, okay. So that's, we're just dealing with a historic building with the canopy and, and trying to trying to lease this in, in uh, the age of COVID. So it's, it's a challenge, but um, so the project's come along nicely and we're hoping to, uh, to put the finishing touches on with this, with these two requests. So I have nothing in addition, unless the board has any other questions. I don't have any more questions on this case. LaShawn, do you? No, we can proceed. And, and by the way, would you like to see, a, um, we, we could have the architects prepare something on 113 if you'd wanna see what that looks like from the North, we'd be happy to submit that. I think that would be helpful um, if it's not too much trouble, just to depict what the view would look like from the back, just to reassure us that we're not going to see the backs of letters and okay. scaffolding. We'll be happy to do that. I, I, believe, I believe you. I believe your testimony, but if that can be depicted, right. um, I think that would help. Yeah, we'll do that, and I'll um, submit that through Daniel, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can okay. send it to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So that uh, that's our testimony as to case 114. Okay, we will close case number 114. Uh, we will, uh, for purposes of the transcript, we will read in the next case and, and begin the, the testimony on the next case. This is zone case 115 of 2020 for 1654 Smallman Street. Uh, the applications for new business identification wall mounted signs. They're requesting a variance from 919.03.m.6.a. The maximum height above grade is 40 feet and 70 feet 8 inches is proposed. So for context, I, this is right across the street from the Prado's terminal buildings that we've just been discussing, right at Smallman Street between 16th and 17th Street. And this was a building that McCaffrey acquired basically at the same time that they've been working on the Prado's terminal building. Um, and so why don't we go, uh, Chuck, why don't you describe the situation, but if we could go to the next slide. Again, this is, let me just, I'll just briefly do this. Um, so this uh, first page just is showing the, the uh, 
site location, which is in the strip district, um, right again, right across the street from the Prouders Terminal at 16th and 17th Street uh, locations. Next page. Uh, it's in the UI zoning district. So that was the basis of the zoning. Next page. Uh, this is the, uh, shows the building. This is, we're looking at the building and then there's a, a parking garage. As part of the development of this building, there was a parking garage that was affixed to the building and added that was actually um, uh, I believe subject to a zoning hearing a number of years ago. Uh, the parking garage is, um, is, is built now. And so the, the, the main building is seen facing Smallman Street. So if we go to the next. Uh, so here's a good depiction of the building. And as you can see, this case, zone 115, we're focused on that business identification sign at the top of the building. And um, I just note, uh, I'll note from the zoning point of view that the height uh, limit in this district is 40 feet. So this is a non-conforming use in terms of height. It's at the closer to the 70 feet or so. And so with that context, Chuck uh, Kennedy will explain why they depicted that sign location or why, why they- Sure. So this building uh, is a four story, uh, we call it the warehouse building. We have uh, one tenant that's taken the second, third and fourth floor of the building. And the first floor will be occupied by uh, a number of retail uh, tenants. Uh, so that's where the colored uh, canopies are shown on, on the ground floor. Uh, the, uh, the request here is to put a sign at the top of the building that would be below the parapet or on the parapet. And as Cliff said, we're limited to 40 feet, but we have uh, an existing non-conforming building. And uh, we request to put this tenant identification sign at the uh, top parapet. And we're putting it, you chose to put it to the far uh, right or uh, I guess Western side of the building. That's correct. That would be on the Northwest corner of the building. And what was the rationale for that? Uh, basically, uh, visibility. Okay, and there'll be traffic, people coming, there's a 16th Street Bridge, and this, this is going to be a significant, uh, the expectation is that there'll be a tenant that will occupy the second, third, and fourth floors, is that right? Yes, there's a signed lease for a single tenant on the second, third, and fourth floor. The uh, developer is seeking retail uses on the first floor. Could be as many as four tenants, five, ten, five tenants. And uh, they'll have their own individual signs uh, on, on the wall or the parapet down low by them. And the uh, tenant that has taken the rest of the building would like to separate their sign and identify themselves at the top of the building. Okay, and uh, we see the next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this, by this, um, we're looking at other signs in the district. We see four signs in the district and the map shows their proximity and they basically show the, the business identification sign is at the top of the building located. So it's consistent with the look in the strip district, both for older adapted reuse buildings and for newer construction. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Can we go back to page five real quick, please? And it doesn't look like, based on the building, you've got very large windows and not a lot of space in between on any of the other floors either. Is that accurate? That, that is accurate. This is a uh, historically a warehouse building. Right. So there's large windows that, pr that provided the light for the historic use. So right, it would be very hard to mount it. It wouldn't, to be at 40 feet or 30 feet, you'd run into the window design and further and it would it would impact kind of that historic look of the big warehouse the old red brick warehouse but just to add clarity uh chuck you touched on something um if this building was uh, conforming then it would be 40 feet tall 
and you would have the sign from an orientation standpoint in the same location, correct? Am I correct. It? Yeah, that's right. So it, <clears throat> we're just putting it in its kind of obvious location at the, you know, at the parapet at the 70 foot elevation, just because that's what the non-conforming building was when we bought it, so. Thank you. So I, don't, I don't know if the board needs to hear any additional testimony. I think it speaks for itself on this particular one, but let us know if you have any questions. Sean? No. I don't have any more questions either. Uh, so oh, if, if we you're do done- have somebody raising their hand right now. Okay. Kate, someone Kate want to be heard? Hi. Hi, I'm Sherston Klein. I'm the owner of 1601 Penn Avenue. Can everybody hear me? Hi, we can. We need to swear you in if you didn't swear in before. I did not. Okay. Do you swear or affirm to tell that uh, the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Please go ahead. I just wanted to um, say as a neighbor um, that I approve of all of these store signage situations. I think it's an excellent way of branding the area and scale on these buildings is absolutely critical. And the branding as a whole, um, it really benefits all of the neighbors in the district. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that. Did anyone else want to be heard on this case? All right, so we will close. Sorry? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, which case number was that that we just finished? That was 115. Okay, so we will close the record on case number 115 and we will uh, proceed to the next case. This is uh, zone case 116 of 2020 for 1654 Smallman Street. The applications for canopy building identification signage, they're requesting variances from 919.03.m.6.c. Maximum letter height is eight inches permitted and one foot four inches was proposed. And the face of such signs shall not project above or below the canopy. Proposed signs would project above the canopy. And just going back to our exhibit packet, here is the uh, first page, the cover page shows the warehouse building and then if you do, um, was the garage, was that the next photo or, um, or pre previous? Well, here, let's go. I'll, I'll just run through this. So 1600 Smallman, uh, we've identified the location, uh, which is Smallman at 16th Street, next. And it's in the UI district, as we've described before. Next. Um, this shows the building and the garage, which we've previously described. And this shows, this is a elevation that shows the, uh, the darker red or brown. Um, you see the existing warehouse and then to the right of that is the parking garage that's been constructed. So the proposed business identification sign is in the upper right corner of the older warehouse. And this application involves the canopies and business identifications and the use of the canopies, uh, which we hope to tie in to um, the across the street on the Prados terminal. So with that, Chuck, why don't you describe um, what the what the thinking was in terms of business identification signs for the four or five tenants that you indicated might be at the first floor level? Sure. This this sign is actually mounted on the uh, canopy above, which has been kind of a theme we've talked about here today. Um, again, we're trying to make it a little more prominent and visible. Uh, the sign will say 1600 Smallman, and uh, it is separate from the tenant signs. Uh, tenants will apply for their own uh, permits, but the red and the blue and the green and the yellow and the purple are all uh, depicting fabric awning signs that the tenants would have. And again, we are trying to avoid having uh, the sign blocked by the canopy or the awnings if we placed it on the wall uh, behind the canopy. So I think there's a next slide with a section or a, yeah, there we go. 
So uh, the right-hand sign is the elevation, showing the sign 1600 small and sitting above the uh, canopy itself. The left side is a section and uh, we're showing it out at the front edge of the canopy, very similar to what we're trying to do across the street and be in context with the other buildings. And again, as with, as with the other buildings, we have a historic building, we have a lot of uh, window facing um, and we have the canopy. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's, some of the, that's, that's the basis for this request. The other thing I would note is for the board's sake, the other thing we want to do is be able to distinguish between the entrance to the building and what might be tenant bays on the first floor level. Um, so this is where the tenants who would be on the second, third floor, you know, floor would go in and enter the building or guests as well. So this is really like the office address. And this is the single request, the single location here at 1600 for this. So for all the reasons we stated uh, before, I, I don't want to be redundant. We, we show the section, it's very similar. We can go to the next slide just to make sure we're not missing any uh, items, similar look of business identification over a canopy, very similar and parallel to what was being proposed in case 114. So I don't know if the board has any questions. I appreciate your time and all the hearings you have to hear in one day. So we're happy to address anything or supplement any information that you require. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know that uh, this development as a whole is, is um, involved a lot of community process and, and a lot of different challenges, not just the signage, but was there a community process relative to the signage proposal? I'll defer to Jeff. I think we've shown renderings. I mean, there's been a lot of process. I don't know that we took this package. Nobody's here to object. I'm just asking for the right. record if, well, if I, anything was yeah. done. It, they have been, uh, as, as Cliff has said, um, They've been part of renderings in the past, but no specific community hearing on the signage itself. Okay. Well, they certainly know what's being proposed and that no one's here to object. So I, I think we can take notice of that. And in this, in this particular case, this is all retail around it, uh, mainly commercial. So uh, you're not really dealing with any residential per se, right. correct? Right. We don't have a residential. Right. Component. Right, and so all of the signage is sort of contained in Smallman Street. That's the only place you're really going to see it. Right. On these blocks. Yeah. And the idea is to create a kind of a festive urban market space like Pike's Market and somewhere where people visit Pittsburgh and they think this has been here forever in this sort of you know, atmosphere and environment. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, LaShawn, do you have any other questions? No. Very good. Thank you for okay. the uh, brevity. Well, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. We'll close well. this hearing. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Appreciate your time. All right, Daniel, we'll close the record. Um, does LaShawn know we're done? Does she want to jump? Or not LaShawn, does I'm, Alice I'm know? Back. LaShawn know knows. Back. <laughs> I know you know. I'm, well, Sean's here with you. I know. So, you know, sometimes I get you guys I know. confused. And I, I think that's the that's the end of our hearings for the day. Yeah. yeah. So um, with that, I think, Zubin, we can go off the live stream. All right. Just give me can one. If you can just confirm when we're off the live stream, we can go through the cases for the day.